So in this video, we're going to summarize three of the inverse trig functions. There are six trig functions, as you know, but there are also kind of the three really famous ones, the sine, cosine, and tangent. And in this video, we're just going to look at those. So in the last video, we talked about how this works. We have this trig function, this sine. We want its inverse, but it doesn't have an inverse. It's not one to one. So we put a restriction on this. And now we no longer have the entire sine function. We just have a teeny bit of the sine function. But this function is invertible. For the sine, we looked at the chunk between negative pi over 2 and positive pi over 2. Um, sadly, the restriction is going to be different for each trig function. No, the cosine. That restriction doesn't fix anything. It doesn't work. You see, this is still not one-to-one -one according to the horizontal line test. So we need a different restriction. So for the cosine, it's going to be x is between 0 and pi. If we restrict the cosine to this little interval, now this horizontal line never touches the cosine more than once, and it's 1 to 1. For the tangent, we need a different restriction. Um, this restriction from 0 to pi does make the tangent 1 to 1, but it's kind of an awkward choice because there's this vertical asymptote right in the middle of this interval. So the tangents restriction is very similar to the sines restriction, actually. The only diff, and this is one to one, as you see. Um, the only difference is that with the sine, we included these endpoints. With the tangent, we don't, because the tangent isn't defined find that pi over 2 or negative pi over 2. So, to once again, I know I'm repeating myself, but to once again summarize what we're doing here, we restrict the trig function and we restrict them in a specific way so that the trig functions are one-to-one -one on that restriction. Oh, neat. I didn't know this road. Anyway. Sorry, I'm learning about this update in real time. Now that we've restricted the trig functions on an interval that makes them one-to-one, -one, we define the inverses of the restricted trig functions. 
And even though these aren't really the inverses of the trig functions, they're the inverses of these restricted functions. We call these the inverse trig functions. And I gave the restrictions on Desmos, but let me also write these down for you. The restriction on the sign is between negative pi over two and positive pi over two, including those endpoints. For the cosine, it was between a zero and pi, again, including the endpoints. For the tangent, it's similar to the sine, but not including the endpoints. And at this point, this might all still be kind of vague. Like, okay, we have inverses, but they're not really inverses, so what can we do with them? We'll get to that in due time. For now, we should say, give some notation or terminology. These restricted functions have inverses. We're calling the inverses, the inverse trig functions, even though they aren't quite. So how do we write down these inverses? Well, there are two ways. Let's use the sign for our example. We can write sin, the, the, the um, abbreviation for the sign, with a negative one up here. Or... We can call it the arc sine of x. And um, arc sine, I would say, is pretty old fashioned. Your textbook uses this notation, but although I don't think I'm in most ways a very old fashioned person, this arc sine, arc cosine, arc tangent. This is what I learned, oh, those many years ago. And this is what I'll continue to call the inverse trig functions. If you don't like that, if you want to use this notation instead, you are absolutely free. You can use either notation. And I'm using the sign kind of as my go-to example, but this is the same notation we use for the cosine. It's the same notation we use for the tangent. So what's this mean? I mean, we have these functions that are almost inverses, but not quite. Let's investigate that. If, if the sine and the arc sine were 
really inverses. Then when you compose them, they would always cancel out. And the arc sign of the sine of x would equal x always. A function and an inverse cancel each other out. But the arc sign and the sign aren't actually inverses. The arc sign is the inverse of the restricted sign function. So what we have instead is that the arc sign of the sine of x equals x, but only if x is in this restriction. So as opposed to what we'd have Come on, let, let me, sorry, continuing to uh, learn this uh, new whiteboard in real time, as opposed to what we'd have if they really were inverses, which would be that we'd have this equality with no qualifications. We have this equality, but it's only true for certain values of x. And now that you've seen that, maybe you can guess what I'm going to write about the arc cosine and the arc tangent. The arc cosine of the cosine of x equals x, but only sometimes, only if x is between a zero and pi. And remember, to make it explicit where this zero to pi is coming from, this was the restriction that we put on the cosine when we defined the arc cosine. Finally, and again, probably predictably, the arc tangent of the tangent of x equals x, but only sometimes. And remember that the restriction for the tangent was this. So that's the arc sine, arc cosine, arc tangent. Um, and probably this seems a little ambiguous. Like we want to use the arc tangent to solve equations. So x is an unknown. It's a variable. We don't know what x is. So how do we know? that x is in this interval. Well, we'll discuss this later. Um, we'll, we'll discuss it much later, as a matter of fact, um, not until chapter
after 9.5 will re really get into this. But in the next video, we'll start to talk about using these things.